King, comforter of the spirit, mm -hmm. and the of our president, for us all things, mm -hmm. treasure, blessings, and giver of life. Come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls with it. Okay, well, why don't we, um, I think we should get started here. Um, Rejoice, O Virgin Theotokos, full of grace, for, from the shown the Son of Righteousness, Christ our God, enlightening those who sat in darkness. Rejoice and be glad, O righteous elder, for thou hast received in thine arms the Redeemer of our souls, who grants us resurrection. Amen. Amen. So, um, I put, I put uh, a text that people can download into the chat. <coughs> So that should be fairly easy to do. Um, and so let's see if I can pull it up here. Um, share screen. Rudik, is that the same text that uh, you asked me to send out ahead of time? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, not this one. And while we're doing that, let me suggest everybody to put yourself on mute uh, and until or unless you're you're speaking so that uh, we don't get interrupted inadvertently. Okay, sorry about the uh, um, the the typeface being so small, but it was the only thing that would fit um, with the uh, formatting that I had transferred it from. So. Um, so basically what I want to talk about tonight um, is how do we enter into uh, noetic prayer? Um, and I think it's really important to understand this in context because the context of, of these writings, the context of, uh, um, of this whole uh, spiritual uh, method of hesychasm um, is in the first place, it's monastic. Um, and it uh, and these texts, especially tonight, but also um, uh, the past couple of weeks from Nikita Stathatos and Saint Simon, the New Theologian, uh, these are uh, those were from the uh, uh, 10th and 11th centuries, and this is from the um, from the uh, 14th century, um, Saint Gregory of Sinai, um, when. Uh, hesychasm had matured to a rather substantial degree and uh, became a very uh, a more a more kind of almost you can't really say it's systematic, but a more um, popular form of asceticism um, uh, on Mount Athos. Um, uh, when Saint Simeon, the new theologian, was alive, Mount Athos uh, had not been founded as a monastic republic yet. Uh, that would be in the mid 11th century, um, 1063, I believe, was the foundation of the Great Lavra. Saint Simeon, the new theologian, died 100 years before that. Saint Gregory of Sinai, um, who was a contemporary of Saint Gregory Palamas, um, uh, lived on lived on the holy mountain um, in the 13, probably 20s to 50s. I'm not sure exactly of his of his uh, biography. Um, and was a major teacher of uh, of hesychasm and of uh, the the way of contemplative prayer, which is noetic prayer. Um, there are th there are things in these uh, in these texts which will be extremely kind of well, maybe difficult um, uh, given a non monastic context, but uh, if you're going to read the Philokalia, um, and these are the great, the, the, these are some of the most important writings specifically on um, uh, prayer in the Philokalia, um, you're going to run into that context. Um, uh, so at the, at, at the time of St. Gregory of Sinai, um, you had the great monasteries, which were Cenobitic or Kenobitic, uh, which were uh, monasteries where life was in common. And there was a huge emphasis on the uh, on the liturgical uh, prayer of the community. Um, 
you know, the uh, had the services were um, in the uh, started were in the middle of the night. Um, then they, uh, you know, with uh, probably matins, um, at least one of the hours and liturgy. Uh, then they would probably do um, uh, the hours during the day, and then at sunset would would be vespers, and then after after dinner was compline. So that was that was the regimen uh, in the Cenobitic monasteries, and people lived uh, very much under obedience um, <laughs> to the abbot and to their spiritual fathers, who were elders uh, who were within the community. Um, and just as um, in the in the last set of uh, 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 let's see, let's, let's okay, that's not that one. In the last set of. Uh, Okay, not that. And all these little windows here. Um, okay. The last set of quotations where, we, uh, where it dealt with um, the growth to spiritual maturity it talked about uh, that the first stage uh, uh, in spiritual life, first stage of monasticism, um, is curtailing the passions. In other words, an active uh, uh, battle against against the passions, both physical as well as on on the mental level, learning how to control thoughts. The second stage um, was psalmody. Now, psalmody. Um, would include uh, the services of the church um, because most of the content of the services of the church is psalmody. Um, uh, the reading of the psalms, the singing of the psalms, um, and especially uh, with the with the uh, monastic usage of uh, going through the Psalter once a week um, in the services um, and or during Lent twice a week. Um, so this, along with uh, the recitation of, of the of the Psalter uh, by the by the uh, novices in their cells or by the monks in their cells, um, was a a stage in in their spiritual formation, their spiritual development, um, where they learn would learn the Psalter even by heart. Um, in the Coptic Church, the uh, the services are nowhere near as developed as our services are, um, but they consist primarily of uh, the recitation of the Psalter, and it's done by each monk once a day, which is a lot. It's like four or five hours. Um, uh, then the third stage um, is perseverance in prayer. Now. The Psalter, um, saying of the Psalter does bring one into this deep state of prayer, um, and it's all and it's already um, and it prepares one uh, to transition into into a into a deeper discipline of prayer. Um, obviously, there are prayers otherwise, you know, from the very beginning. Um, but what we're talking about ultimately with Hezekiah. Um, and the development of a of noetic prayer on the highest level um, is is that it's an entire lifestyle. It's not just it's not just what do you do when you pray. It's every aspect of life um, is included in this um, in this practice. Um, so um, uh, so. So the fourth stage, um, just just by way of review, um, uh, was for old men with gray hair. This signifies undeviating absorption in contemplation. 
And this is the state of the perfect. So the journey is complete and the top of the ladder has been reached. Noetic prayer is contemplation. Now there's different, um, and in the Philokalia, there are different uh, um, ideas about what constitutes contemplation. Um, there, there's contemplation of, uh, you know, various and sundry kinds of uh, um, doctrines or events in the life of Christ and things like that. The doctrine of the Trinity, the incarnation, you know, things like that. Um, and truly, and this is a kind of a contemplation, but it's it's not the contemplation of noetic prayer. Con the contemplation that, that I'm referring to occurs in si in silence, silence of the body, silence of the mouth. In other words, no words. Silence of the mind. The stilling of all thoughts. Um, emotions, memories, images, all of that. Because what happens in as we ascend into the de the deeper, deeper and deeper into prayer, or descend deeper and deeper into prayer, whichever would you would use, um, there's a uh, there's a kind of a falling away of uh, of cognitive activity until finally the um, the stillness leads us to a state of pure awareness. Um, but it's not rational awareness. It's noetic awareness because the rational mind has been silenced. And that noetic awareness, that spiritual um, experience and participation already is rooted in God, rooted in grace. Um, and so the goal that's a, and the goal that's achievable, and especially um, for living in the world, it is entirely achievable. Um, to be able to enter into this deep stillness. How much deeper uh, you go, of course, depends on the grace of God. But what, but what it is, it's a synergy. It's a synergy with the grace of the Holy Spirit that takes us deeper and deeper and deeper um, uh, out, out of, outside of our, out of our uh, rational consciousness which is really like a shell into into that that deep person of the heart into that into that uh, authentic noetic awareness and where he takes us he takes us because that's um because then god becomes the active party um in that level of transformation now the fathers talk about um Three levels of theoria, which is uh, contemplation. Um, there's con sim simple contemplation. In other words, um, where we, where through prayer, through the Jesus prayer, or um, uh, or through lexio divina of the scriptures, or of the of the patristic texts, um, when we when we sit and wait and when we sit with the text um, and silence our minds, and it leads us into a deeper and deeper experience and communion with God. Same thing with the Jesus prayer. It takes us to a point where the words drop off and we're in silence in the presence of God. That's the first level of contemplation. It's very peaceful. It's very a wonderful thing. But uh, but that but that's that's only the beginning. Um, the next 
and but this is where there's a transition from us actively uh, engaged in um, in this process of uh, going deeper and deeper um, from our mind into our heart. Once we've gotten to the place of the heart, then God takes over. Then the grace of the Holy Spirit takes over. And there's, and it's also, this is also the process of the deification of our, of our soul and the deification of our, of our mind. Um, because we're united uh, uh, by the Holy Spirit with Christ to the Father. And so, um, and it's the noose that is the organ, as it were, of that communion. Um, it's the organ of perception of God. It's the organ of perception of grace and of the will of God. Um, now, initially, that experience is, is basically of, of a kind of unlimited vastness. Um, uh, and what it takes is to get there is we have to we have to uh, completely renounce um, our attachments to everything, everyone, everything. Which doesn't mean completely get rid of them. It means to reorder them. Um, sometimes it, it takes getting, you know, losing things and detaching completely. Um, but it also means that we have to uh, detach from our thoughts and and let and let our thoughts go. We hold, we deal with thought with thoughts are the means of um, of how we process the environment. But thoughts are always only on the rational level. There's no such thing as a noetic thought. Okay, it doesn't work. Um, but the thoughts are um, the means of how our brain processes the data that comes into it. Now there is there is an aspect, and this I think is this is what is um, uh, referred to as the prayer of the mind in the heart. Um, you see that in, you know, in various writings. Um, and it's where the, um, um, where the mind is, our rational mind is, um, is connected to and informed by our noetic awareness. Um, and so, for example, uh, when we're in church and we're in liturgical prayer or when we're doing private prayer and we're using, we may be using canons and akathists and other written prayers, or we may be, you know, in the, maybe the services, or we may be, um, you know, quietly saying, saying the Jesus prayer, um, that, that noetic awareness dawns on us, literally. And, um, and on one hand, it becomes a kind of a, uh, um, a synergy, a cooperation between the rational mind and 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 the noose. But eventually, what happens is that the noose takes over, and the rational mind becomes silent. Um, one one of the fathers I don't remember who talks about the the uh, job of the rational mind is to fend off um, thoughts um, so that uh, so that so that we're not even conscious of of that battle. There's an aspect of um, <laughs> of this first level of contemplative prayer. Um, which looks like sleep outside, from the outside. 
but it's actually a an experience of the most profound concentration. <laughs> Um, so um, is, is, are there any any questions right now? Does this make sense? Yes, no. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Sure. About attachments. Uh -huh. um, and the question that I guess I'm I'm wrestling with is I, I was actually just reading today because um I couldn't go to church this morning because we were kind of battling some germs here at our house. And um so I was reading um Elder Thaddeus, our thoughts determine our lives. Uh -huh. It talks a lot about you know poetic prayer and things like that. Yeah. got into that concept of detachment yeah. and it it talks about you know like even if you should be so detached that you don't even mourn yeah. someone's yeah. loss mourn loss uh -huh. people okay one one second okay could everybody mute mute the, except unless until unless you're going to talk okay so okay okay Kelly, go ahead. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I think that um, it was talking about being so detached that you don't even necessarily mourn. And I I started to kind of think about that and, and thinking about what mourning is and like if something happened to, like, I'm a mother and I can't even imagine getting to the point where, you know, like if something happened to one of my children that I would be so detached that I, I couldn't mourn for them. And and I was I was wondering if if that's if that's a level that they're talking about. I I just it was beyond kind of what I could comp comprehend. Well, there is a lot there is a level, but yes, that's beyond most of our comprehension. I mean that's that's probably a level of the great elders. So it wouldn't be expected. No, it's not, it's not expected. None of, the, none of none of this is is required. Okay. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I understand that, but I I uh, mean obviously we want to try. You know, I know it's for the monastics and and that kind of thing, but you want to try to enter in to the extent that you are able. But I was just a little bit um, overwhelmed by that thought. Actually, so that's mm -hmm. why I ask. <laughs> well, well, part of it part of it is. Um, you get into a, you get go on into a, a level of uh, spiritual awareness that um, and you don't allow anything. Um, you know, I mean, the, the these higher levels, um, their only focus is God. Their only focus is God. Um, and everyone in God. Now, if somebody dies, they're still in God. Right? Right. Okay. So, um, why mourn? Uh, right. Yeah. Right. It's hard. You know, and this is because, and what that presumes is a very, very high level of absolute self control over. Over our emotion, over all of our emotions, our thoughts. Um, so, could you, could you define it as trust in God? I mean, is that ultimately what it comes down to? Is it's absolute, complete surrender to God. Mm -hmm. And so, um, now that complete surrender to God is is something that that uh, we need to we need to to strive for. That um, you know that's. Uh, because what because what else really you know what else really is there uh, in being a Christian besides completely surrendering ourselves to the will of God? Isn't that ultimately what being a Christian is? Where we are completely united to uh, in Christ by the Holy Spirit. Yes. Father. Yeah. So, but it takes 
it takes most of us a long time to get there. Um, and as I said, in, uh, as we were beginning, some of the, some of the things in this are going to be kind of shocking because this is this is a this is these are monastic texts written to monastic audiences, um, and quite frankly, the uh, some of these texts are you know written to the highest level of people of the highest level of higher levels of spiritual maturity. Um, and uh, so, I mean, we can be informed by them. We can we can see where that is to go. Like you, like a little kid will look up at it, up at his father or his grandfather, um, or mother and grandmother to see. Well, I'm going to get there someday. <laughs> um, but uh, right now, we have to we have to remember that in 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 our practice our spiritual practice we're infants we're infants we're just beginning in fact but on the other hand one of one of the uh one of the things about so many of the of the great fathers um is they their attitude was you always have to regard yourself as a beginner in the spiritual life So, um, yeah, Nikita. Yes, um, <clears throat> Vladik, I was, I was um, touched by uh, Kelly's um, question about mourning. Uh -huh. And it brought to mind the, um, you know, the, this concept that Jesus Christ is uh, both a man, limited as a man, and our God. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I remembered... Uh, how he, in the passage, mourned for the death of, uh, La death of Lazarus, and uh -huh. you know, the various interpretations that that's given. But in, in my view, that's somehow that it's part of our human nature is to mourn, even Christ's right. nature. Well, and it, we would say a nuance, I think, to the idea of mourning. Yeah, I, I think what I was referring to was to was to was to be carried away with mourning. Yeah. You know, obviously, you know, we're, we're going to have an emotional reaction. We're only human. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but to allow our, to allow ourselves to be carried away with it um, is not healthy. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, and, you know, and, you know, and it becomes a passion, in other words. Mm -hmm. um, and the passions all function on the level of, of our ego. Mm -hmm. um, so as Christians, uh, when we when when we lose someone, I mean, obviously there's that emotional bond. We're mourning more for ourselves and our loss than for that than for that person who is who has moved into the into the hands of God in the kingdom in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, So, um, but then, you know, so, so there's an aspect of when mourning becomes um, uh, overwhelming um, and, and people, you know, just stay in the state of mourning for years and years and years, that there's an aspect that it becomes selfish. Mm -hmm. um, so... Um, and that's not, that's not, we can't do that as, as Christians. Um, it becomes a sinful state, actually. Um, because, and, and, it, and everything gets sucked into it, including faith. So, this is not to say that um, the fathers would not have had, would not have an emotional reaction to um to losing somebody close um but uh it would be controlled so thank you yeah. you're welcome
Anybody else? Ah, Brother Vladimir. Is, I, I know I missed the other sessions, but is there a correspondence between noose and the heart? Yes. Okay. The, um, very often in the spiritual literature, the heart refers to the noose. Um, sometimes it's called it's it's called spirit. Um, sometimes it's called it's where the spiritual part of man, you know, body, soul, and spirit, which means um, uh, the rational rational mind is the soul, or is part of the soul. Um, uh, the soul is that which is is connected with the body, but the noose is connected with the soul, but is um, but is of a different nature. The noose is um, uh, is noetic. It's it's of the same nature as the angels. Um, but there's this synergy between the uh, the the soul and uh, and the noose. And you know, part of part of the task of uh, restoring our noetic awareness is to return to that state of Adam before the fall, um, the original way in which man was created so that the noose, the noetic awareness was primary. In the fall, the rational awareness became primary uh, and the noose got buried um, beneath the thoughts, emotions, feelings, uh, memories, um, imagination, all of these other things. And so and so the, the task of the spiritual life is to bring it um, to primacy so that every other aspect of our life is informed by, um, not only but not only informed by, but um, the noose is the, is that means by which, we enter into synergy with God, into into the with the will of God, the activity and energy of God by direct perception. Okay, Alexander. Right, uh, words in this in this sphere are confusing or maybe not, you know, completely defined. I think we've talked about this some before, but in in this paragraph up that's on the screen, there's a lot of discussion about the intellect. Uh -huh. And uh, later on, I think he makes a distinction between the intellect and the mind. Mm -hmm. can, can you expand on that a little bit? Well, one of the problems with this translation, this is the Faber and Faber translation, um, is that it used the Latin word, the Latin translation of noose which is intellect. Now, in American English, we think of the intellect as the rational mind, right? Primarily. Um, and so, so it, it becomes confusing. You know, there's a, another, another um, bad translation in this, at least for Americans, um, uh, in which they translate um, uh, kenodexia, which is vainglory, as self-esteem. <laughs> um, you can understand vainglory as self-esteem um, in certain contexts, but in other contexts, and especially our psychobabble context, um, self-esteem is something good, not something bad. Um, so, whereas vainglory is one of the principal passions. So, Part of this is um, uh, is is a translation. There's a translation problem. This needs to be translated um, from British to English <laughs> or British to American. So, um, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Nikita. Okay. Did you have something? Yes, I, I've read something by uh, John Ramanides, who's uh -huh. a, a, a Greek theologian. Uh, and what he, he said is that you have noetic energy, noetic energy that's active in the region, the physical region of the heart. 
Mm -hmm. And the idea of nous being spirit or nous being intellect is used by the fathers in various ways uh, throughout the scriptures. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, n previously, but now it, it, it means more the spirit than the intellect. That, that's right. That's, yeah. So, you know, and, and the basic idea, it seems to me, is that the noose is the faculty that, that's, that's available to man uh, for deification. Right. Uh, and so you might have the different words, but it's, it's all of these words are intended uh, for, um, for, the, for, for, for the practice of hesychasm. Right. And, and the path to hesychasm. So, you know, I, I don't think there's a single word that you'll find that defines noose by itself because there are different uses as uh, John Ramanides would have it. Uh, that's my sense. Uh, uh, yeah, um, the thing well, is... The... It's, 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 towards, it's towards the uh, discipline of, of hesychasm and it's all in, implied to, in, in, yeah, as, as a path to that discipline. Well, there are two aspects of, of how the word was developed. One, it's it's an ancient word in Greek philosophy, and it's used throughout the, the, the New Testament as well. Um, but simply the Latin translation of the word nous in Latin is intellect, intellectus, um, which is why it, why it gets confusing. Um, Romanides was, uh, was an American who... Um, uh, who was fluent in Greek, and um, sometimes his, his uh, sometimes he's he's clearer than others um, in some of his uh, 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 some of his works. But um, you know, so in, so for in, in these texts here, where where it says intellect, you just substitute the word noose, and that's what you've got. The, our concept, our colloquial concept of intellect has nothing to do with the concept of news. Our colloquial concept of intellect means um, the rational mind per se, I would think. Um, and there's a relationship between the news and the rational mind, but they're, they're, they're distinct distinct parts of the soul, aspects of the soul. So why don't we read through the um, uh, read through the text here? Somebody would somebody like to read? Okay. Starting here. Okay. There are two modes of union, or rather two ways of entering into the noetic prayer that the spirit activates in the heart. For either the intellect cleaving to the Lord is present in the heart or to the action of the prayer or the prayer itself progressively quickened in the fire of spiritual joy draws the intellect along with it and welds it to the invocation of the Lord Jesus and to union with him. For since the spirit works in each person as he wishes one of the one of these two ways we have mentioned will take precedence in some people the other in others sometimes as the passions subside through the ceaseless invocation of the jesus of jesus christ a divine energy wells up in the heart and a divine warmth is kindled for scripture says that our God is a fire that consumes the passions. At other times, the spirit draws the intellect to himself, confining it to the depths of the heart and restraining it from its usual distractions. Then it will no longer be led captive from Jerusalem to the Assyrians but a change for the better brings it back from Babylon to Zion, so that it says with the psalmist, It is right to praise thee, O God, 
and Zion, and to thee shall our vows be rendered in Jerusalem. And when the Lord brought back the prisoners to Zion, and Jacob will rejoice, and Israel will be glad. The names of Jacob and Israel refer respectively to the ascetically active and to the contemplative intellect, which through ascetic labor and with God's help overcomes the passions and through contemplation sees God. For so as far as is so far as is possible. Then the intellect as if invited to a rich banquet and replete with divine joy will sing, Thou hast prepared a table before me in the face of the demons and passions that afflict me. Okay. So let's go through this um, slowly. Uh, there are two modes of union because what we're talking about um, uh, is union with God. That's 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 the goal of of prayer. Um, you know, we're not talking about um, uh, the oral and mental prayer of uh, of words or of supplication or of asking God for things or uh, for intercession for people. Uh, that's another kind of prayer. But this kind of prayer is the ascent to union, which can only be. Um, uh, uh, done um, noetically. Um, there are two modes of union, or rather two ways of entering into the noetic prayer that the spirit activates in the heart. It's important to remember that noetic prayer is activated by the spirit. Um, it's not um, it's not something that we can do uh, of ourselves. It's only by the only by the grace of the Holy Spirit, because it's energized by the by the activity, the energy of God, which is grace. Um, for either the noose, you substitute the word noose for intellect, uh, either the noose cleaving to the Lord is present in the heart prior to the action of the prayer. In other words, for somebody who has who has been um, uh, deeply engaged in prayer and has and has entered into uh, prayer of the heart, um, or the prayer itself, progressively quickened in the fire of spiritual joy, draws the noose along with it, or welds it to the invocation of the Lord Jesus and to union with Him. Um, so. Um, so, so the idea is, is that um, the grace of the Holy Spirit um, is perceived by and energizes the noose, which is already present in the heart. And here it's talking about um, the core of our being, not necessarily uh, the organ of the heart, but not necessarily not the organ either. Um, but so there's a correspondence, but not necessarily an identity. Um, or the prayer itself progressively quickening the fire of spiritual joy. In other words, um, the prayer itself uh, becomes uh, animated um, uh, when in uh, by spiritual joy, and it draws the the noose along with it, or welds it to the invocation of the Lord Jesus. In other words, the Jesus prayer, uh, and to union with Him. So the goal of all of this is towards union with God, union in Christ by the Holy Spirit to the Father. Um. Okay, Peter, you had your hand up. Now you answered my question, Vladika, about what was meant by the heart. Um, uh -huh. yeah. Okay. Um, 
For since the Spirit works in each person, person as he wishes, one of these two ways we have mentioned will take precedence in some people, the other in others. Depends on their spiritual development. Um, sometimes as the passions subside through the ceaseless invocation of Jesus Christ, a divine energy wells up in the heart and a divine warmth is kindled. In other words, through the Jesus prayer, um, uh, the passions subside um, and, but at the same time, we enter into a deeper and deeper um, synergy with the grace of the Holy Spirit, um, which is what uh, unites us to Christ. Um, and when and when that um, uh, and when that union happens, um, this divine el energy wells up in our hearts. Um, and uh, a kind of a divine warmth is kindled. This is this can be um, this can be figurative or this can be literal. Where Scripture says that our God is a fire that consumes the passions. Of course, this is a that's an allegorical use of of, of that passage. At other times, the Spirit draws the intellect to Himself confining it to the depths of the heart and restraining it from its usual distractions. In other words, I think what he's describing is um, uh, when this, uh, there's, a, there's a point in the prayer when um, uh, there's, when, when we are only, when we become purely conscious noetically, and um, and and we're simply um, in a state of communion. It's not a matter of um, of there's no there's no thoughts there's no images there's no feelings there's no concepts there's no imagination there's no nothing it's simply pure noetic experience communion um, and it's always an and it's an experience of union it's not an experience of an I thou it's an experience of union. In other words, um, in going into that place, the only you're conscious of God and in God. It's a transcendence of self. It's not that the self ceases to exist, but it's a transcendence of that self consciousness. Um, Uh, and in that, there are no distractions. So then there's this long rhetorical passage about um, that it will no longer be led captive from Jerusalem to the Assyrians, but but a change for the better. It brings it back from Babylon to Zion, so that it says with the psalmist, it is right to praise the O God in Zion, that these shall our vows be rendered in Jerusalem. In other words, we enter into 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 uh, the homeland of our heart's desire. We enter into that living experience of the communion of God, of communion with God in the kingdom. Um, which is Zion and Jerusalem. Okay, so jumping down to here. The names Jacob and Israel refer respectively to the aesthetically active and to the contemplative in intellect, um, Jacob on one and Israel the other, which through ascetic labor and with God's help overcomes the passions and through contemplation sees God so far as this is possible. Um, there... There, there's always a combination of ascetic labor, but that only takes us so far. The ascetic labor will lead us to a place where we're not controlled by and have control of, of what had been passions. 
but to go to the next step, um, uh, to go into the into the process of of sanctification and deification, that is through con contemplation. That's through theria, which is um, noetic prayer. Um, okay, Father Vladimir. Yes, Valdeka, can, can you delineate the two paths? Because the first uh, is talking about uh, cleaving to the Lord and is present in the heart prior to the action of the prayer. You know, in my naivete, I always thought that the prayer was the path to that state. And, and the implication of this phrase for me is that you're you're there before you even started to pray, and how does that happen? Well, I I think I think what they're talking about this is going back to the what third or fourth line, um, uh, you know, people. Well, in monasteries, for example, um, some people have um, have lead a very um, active ascetic life. You know, they're um, there's, you know, there's prostrations, there's, you know, um, you know, long vigils and and things like that. And of course, there's prayer. That's all a lot of it is is lots of prayer, in, including long services and and all of that. Um that but that's all act that's all the active life. Now, remember the Holy Spirit can work in a person as he wills. And sometimes the Holy Spirit really, you know. Uh, will touch a person in that. Um, uh, whereas um, other people, um, and the, he'll touch the person in that even before, for example, somebody who's uh, doing psalmody and all, all the external prayers and things like that, God will touch them and, and awaken their, their minds. So, for example, in St. Silouan, he was a novice, and he was uh, praying in the chapel, and Christ stepped out of the icon and revealed himself to St. Silouan. Um, I think, you know, this was this was long be this was before uh, St. Silouan was, um, uh, you know, on any kind of um, path to higher uh, ascetic or higher uh, spiritual maturity. He was just a novice. Um, on the other hand, somebody can be laboring in that for years, and it's only after uh, years that the Holy Spirit will choose to open up um, up their noetic awareness. Um, uh, there's a great Catholic mystic, uh, Spanish mystic. Um, uh, Saint Teresa of Avila, and one of her nuns came to her and said, "All everything, all these prayers are are beautiful, and I do them all, but I have no spiritual awareness whatsoever." And so she said to her, "Well, that is actually there is a great blessing from God in that, because that means that you're going on pure faith." It's what keeps keeps you going. Now, some people do have a very, and we're talking about um, this exactly. Some people do have this mystical awareness, and some people don't. Um, does that mean that one is greater than the other? No. It's how God works with each person. Um, does that make sense? Does that answer the question? Yes, it's, uh, I'm just astounded that there's this parallel path, which seems to be a shortcut, but maybe it's like you're all of a sudden you're in God completely. Uh, yeah. And it's just God's, uh, God, the, the spirit blows where it wants to and 
he knows how to reach a, a soul. Yep. And it's um and he and he deals with each one of us uniquely and individually. Okay, Ksenia. So I think I'm uh, following to to the uh, question. So is that means uh, for Saint Silwan that even though he was novice and he was not, uh, was he or he was not uh, released from his passions when he had his experience or the 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 passions did not interfere with the experience in that moment. Um, I I don't know. Uh, my guess is that um, his passions did, did not interfere with the experience. Um, but my guess is also that after that experience, um, he probably had himself pretty well under control. Okay. Because, because the, the grace of God burns away the passions. So it's that 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 kind of I want as well. So when he experienced this, it was kind of like a fire that extinguished all that was in him. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, I understand. Thank you. Yeah, it's his book. The book on his life by uh, Saint Sophroni is well worth reading. Okay, uh, Saint Silouan of Monathos. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So is there anything else right yet? Right yet? Okay. Um, uh, then the, uh, from here, then the intellect as if, or then the news, as if invited to a rich banquet and replete with divine joy will sing, Thou hast prepared a table before me in the presence, face of the demons and passions. Um, uh, in other words, when God opens up that noetic consciousness, um, it's like a rich banquet. Um, uh, but it also, as... Um, uh, and 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 we become filled with joy, but also with compunction. Um, so, but but there's also the that effect of grace, which helps us to overcome um, to overcome the passions. So, somebody want to read? Second paragraph. Okay. It's it's a little challenging, but <laughs> okay. The beginning of watchfulness. In the morning, sow your seed, says Solomon. And by seed to be understood, the seed of prayer. And in the evening, do not withhold your hand, so that there may not be so there may be no break in the continuity of your prayer, no moment when through lack of attention you cease to prayer. For you do not know which will flourish, this or that, Ecclesiastics. Sitting, down, sitting from dawn on a seat about nine inches high, compel your intellect to descend from your head into your heart and retain it there keeping your head forcibly bent downwards and suffering acute pain in your neck, shoulders, and neck. Persevere in repeating noetically or in your soul, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. Then, since that may become constrictive and wearisome and even grilling or ga ga galling because of the constant repetition, though this is not because you are constantly eating the one food of the threefold name, for those who eat me, say, says scripture, will still be hungry, Ecclesiastics. Let your intellect concentrate on the second half of the prayer and repeat the words, Son of God, have mercy. 
You must say this half over and over again and not run out of laziness and now, I'm sorry, and not out of laziness, constantly change the words. For plants which are frequently transplanted do not have, do not put down roots. Restrain your breathing so as not to breathe unimpededly. For when you exhale, the air rising from the heart beclouds the intellect and ruffles your thinking. Uh, just a second. I, uh, this is it's much bigger. Yeah, let, let me let me switch screens now. I guess you can still hear me. Where where is it in here? Right there. Keeping the intellect. Oh, keeping the intellect away from the heart. Um, so let me re reread that again. Restrain your breathing so as not to breathe unimpededly. For when you exhale, the air rising from the heart beclouds the intellect and ruffles your thinking, keeping the intellect away from the heart. Then the intellect is either enslaved by forgetfulness or induced to give its attention to all manner of things, insensibly becoming preoccupied with what it should ignore. If you see impure evil thoughts rising up and assuming various form in your forms in your intellect, do not be startled. Even if the images of good things appear to you, pay no attention to them. Let me reread that again. Even if images of good things appear to you, pay no attention to them. But restraining your breathing as much as possible and enclosing your intellect in your heart, invoke the, le the Lord Jesus continuously and diligently, and you will swiftly consume and subdue them slaying them invisibly with the divine name. For St. John Climacus says, with the name of Jesus, lash your enemies, for there is no more powerful weapon in heaven or on earth. <clears throat> I, I think that's the paragraph. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, beginning of watchfulness. Watchfulness, uh, Nepsis, is, the, is, the, is actually the title of the Philokalia. Um, that it's uh, uh, it's all of, that it's all about watchfulness. In other words, watching over your thoughts um, uh, and learning how to control them, um, which is the uh, content of much of the spiritual life. So, um, in the morning, sow your seed, says Solomon. By seed is to be understood the seed of prayer. And in the evening, do not withhold your hands so that there may be no break in the continuity of your prayer. No moment when through lack of attention, you cease, you cease to pray. In other words, um, pray in the morning, pray in the evening, and, um, and keep praying all the rest of the time between them. Um, so that there is no break in the continuity of, of prayer. This, of course, is um, directed at Hesychast, who... Uh, do nothing else, basically. Um, uh, uh, but, but, um, but I think what's what's important um, is that so uh, we need to strive where there be no break in the continuity of our prayer. And no, no moment when lack of through lack of attention, we cease to pray. Um, this is very hard, and this is very, very advanced, way beyond me. Um, uh, um, but uh, if you were sitting in a cave on Mount Athos, looking over the sea, um, you could do this. Um, so this is this here is uh, this is more about method. Uh, sitting from dawn on a seat about nine inches high, compel your intellect to descend from your head into your heart. In other words, focus your focus your spirit your attention um, uh, where its usual focus is is in in the head. We have to bring it down into the heart. And and the focal point of, of of the mind at that point is the presence of God, is the awareness of God. And so that 
that we start with it uh, remembering that God exists. That's a rational thought, right? It's an objective, rational thought, uh, and God is an object. But when we when we move it from from the rational mind from uh, uh, into into the into the heart into the into the noose, um, it becomes the awareness of God. Um, uh, compel your intellect to descend from your head into your heart and retain it there. Um, this is this is as I said, this is very advanced practice. Keep your head forcibly bent downwards and suffering acute pain in your chest, shoulders, and neck. Persevere in repeating noetically, in other words, um, in your, uh, this is the mind and the heart, where you would say the Jesus prayer, but it's a, it's a combination of not only the rational mind, because there's words and concepts involved, but also prayer in the heart, of the heart. Um, uh, repeating, uh, uh, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy. So this is um, uh, you know, the, the Jesus prayer gets abbreviated in all sorts of different ways. And this is one of them. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy, have mercy on me, something like that. Um, But then he then he then he has a, a condescension to to human weakness. Then, since that may become constrictive and wearisome, and even galling because of the constant repetition, um, uh, though this is not because you are constantly uh, uh, eating the food the one, one food of the threefold name for those who, in other words, there's a rhetorical. Um, let your intellect, your news, concentrate. On the second half of the prayer, Son of God, have mercy. Um, uh, repeating it over and over. Um, and uh, without changing the words all the time. Um, in other words, it's important to keep, to remember that the Jesus prayer is a prayer. It's not a mantra. Um, uh, it's, it's a prayer in which we're crying out to, to Christ for mercy. Uh, which means that we're affirming his primary relationship to the world is one of love and compassion, which is mercy. Um, uh, okay. Um, let your intellect concentrate on the second half of the prayer and repeat the words, Son of God, have mercy. You must say this half over and over again, and not out of laziness, constantly change the words. For plants which are frequently transplanted do not put down roots. Rest okay, now this advice on breathing, um, a lot of the, uh, uh, the contemporary elders um, and uh, in, the Russian, in the Russian tradition especially um, say, don't pay attention to the instructions on breathing. Um, uh, they have a place, um, but it's something that, that can only be done um, with the immediate personal supervision of an elder. Um, and that's, I don't think any of us have that. Um, uh, you know, and, and also this kind of um, this invokes a whole kind of medieval idea of, of uh, physiology, which doesn't really make sense in our context. Um, but, I, but I think one of the things that we can take from it is that we need to breathe naturally um, and not kind of... Um, not heavy, not breathe heavily, not, um, you know, not uh, take these huge deep breaths and, and let them out, you know, very slowly or something like that. That's, that's a good relaxation technique, but um, 
that's not that's really not for the, for the uh for the Jesus prayer um so um so but but if um uh if our if our hearts become cloudy in other words um uh, we become distracted and as it says it be cloud it be clouds the intellect and ruffles your thinking keeping the intellect away from the heart well this is that's a it's a little too um physiological uh then the intellect is either enslaved by forgetfulness forgetfulness means um the lack of remembrance of god um or induced to give its attention to all manner of things insensibly becoming uh preoccupied with what it should ignore in other words distractions if uh but another thing that can happen during this process um is that all sorts of images and thoughts can rise up um if you see uh here, if you see impure evil thoughts rising up and assuming various forms in your intellect, in other words, portraying these things, um, uh, do not be startled. Even if images of good things appear to you, pay no attention. The fathers tell us that uh, when we pray and when we enter into the deeper levels of prayer, um, it's very important uh, not, to, not to let ourselves get distracted by thoughts. Good thoughts or evil thoughts. Uh, just notice that they're there and let it go. Um, uh, but restrain your breathing as much as possible and enclosing your intellect in your heart, your, um, your, your noose in your heart. Invoke the Lord Jesus continually and diligently and you will swiftly consume and subdue them, playing the, them invisibly with the divine name. In other words, using yeah. using the Jesus prayer is like a is uh, like slaying the demon. Saint John Climacus says, "For with the name of Jesus, lash your enemies, for there is no powerful weapon in heaven or on earth." Okay, Peter. Um, you mentioned letting go of the thoughts. One way I was thinking of it is sometimes a thought or an image comes up, but your intention is not to be distracted by that, but to focus on God. So could it be almost like the idea that the thought or the image is you, you look through it? Uh -huh. You look through it to God. You you don't. It, it wants to grab your attention, but you you acknowledge it's there. But you're sort of looking through it as though it's as, as though it's sort of a vapor or a. Um... Well, that's all it is in reality. That's all all thoughts are. You know, we we pay we tend to um, take ourselves so seriously that we think each thought is important. In reality, it's not. A thought is just a thought. I mean, it's it's nothing. It has no substance to it. Right. And so, and so ultimately, what we need to do, learn how to do, is to ignore our thoughts. Okay. Um, especially in time of prayer, when we're trying to to focus on the presence of God, because you know what they what the, in a sense you could say that what what it is these thoughts are implanted or suggested by the demons to distract us from God. Yeah, thank you, buddy. Okay, Monk A, do you have a question? Hmm. Okay, anybody else on this? Please. Um, well, I mean, I, again, from my naivete, uh, I 
you know, I think I need to, you know, when I pray, I think about the people I'm praying for. And I think about the words of my, the prayers that I say. I mean, how can I not think? I mean, it, I know that this, I guess this only pertains to the Jesus prayer, right? Because I, you know, I do, as we all do other prayers and I do think about them. I, I, I try, in fact, I think, you know, I try to stop myself when I stop thinking about them. Well, no, I mean, when we're, when we're praying uh, for people, intercessory prayer or something like that, um, yeah. of course we need to think about them. Uh, yeah. If we're reading prayers, we need to think about them. We need to be engaged with the text. Yes. We're engaging with our mind, but, and, but also, um, so when I tell people when, when you begin your prayer rule, the first thing you want to do before you even say anything is connect with God. Remember that God is present. And if you and if and if you can, um, open up your awareness to the presence of God. <clears throat> you know, very often, you know, um, I mean, we have that in just in in front of our icons, right? Yes. Yeah. And so you're already praying with your mind in your heart. Okay. Oh. Um, the mind is still engaged. The rational mind is still engaged, remembering people and praying the words and things like that. But there's also a level of noetic engagement, involvement in that. Mm -hmm. um, now, noet uh, noetic prayer, especially, I mean, the highest levels, well, I don't even know. <laughs> um, I've met a couple of, of elders like that, but I haven't had a chance to, you know, quiz them about it. You know, that's not the, would have, wouldn't have been my place anyway. Um, but, uh, and that's, that's all, that's already prayer of the mind and the heart. But then the Jesus prayer is, is, is a, uh, it's a different kind of prayer. It's a prayer of union, prayer of communion. And so, and so really what the movement is in the Jesus prayer is we use the Jesus prayer to the point where it, where it goes into silence and we're simply present to God and God is present to us. We're in a living experience of communion. And we just sit there in that silence. Um, and then God takes it from there, wherever he wills. But we have to let him do that. You see, this is where surrender to God um, is very important. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Okay, anybody else? Okay, let's let's read through this uh, um, paragraph nine. I, obviously, I didn't bring in this whole text of uh, uh, which is called uh, Two Ways of Prayer in the Philokalia. It's what on page um, 263 of volume four. Um, so who'd like to read this paragraph nine? I'll be glad to do that. Okay. So I will add this from my own small experience. When you sit in stillness by day or by night, free from random thoughts and continuously praying to God in humility, you may find that your intellect becomes exhausted through calling upon God and that your body and heart begin to feel pain because of the intense concentration with which you unceasingly invoke the name of Jesus, with the result that you no longer experience the warmth and joy that engender ardor and patience in the spiritual aspirant. If this is the case, stand up and solemnize, either by yourself or with a disciple who lives with you, or occupy yourself with meditation or some scriptural passage, or with the remembrance of death, or with manual labor, or with some other thing, 
or give your attention to reading, preferably standing up so as to involve your body in the task as well. When you stand and psalmodize by yourself, recite the Trisagion and then pray in your soul or your intellect, making your intellect pay attention to your heart and recite two or three Psalms and a few penitential triparia, but without chanting them. As St. John Climacus confirms, people at this stage of spiritual development do not chant. For the suffering of the heart endured in a spirit of devotion, as St. Mark puts it, is sufficient to produce joy in them, and the warmth of the spirit is given to them as a source of grace and exaltation. After each psalm, again pray in your intellect or soul, keeping your thoughts from wandering, and repeat the Alleluia. This is the order established by the Holy Fathers, Barnasupius, Diodocus, and others. And as St. Basil the Great says, one should vary the psalms daily to enkindle one's fervor and to prevent the intellect from getting bored with having to recite always the same things. The intellect should be given freedom, and then its fervor will be quickened. If you stand and psalmodize with a trusted disciple, let him recite the psalms while you guard yourself secretly watching your heart and praying. With the help of prayer, ignore all images, whether sensory or conceptual, that rise up from the heart. For stillness means the shedding of all thoughts for a time, even those which are divine and engendered by the Spirit. Otherwise, through giving them our attention because they are good, we will lose what is better. Okay. I thought this was, uh, this paragraph would, was very, um, uh, very helpful in, in that it comes, he's, he's saying this is his own experience. Now, this is one of the greatest elders, you know, the um, uh, masters of the Jesus prayer. Uh, has he cast that the church has ever had? You know, one of the great has he cast fathers. Um, um, so he's he's also has a very pastoral sense um, because uh, sometimes you you can go on and on and on, you know, in prayer for a long time, and other times you just don't have the energy um, and you're distracted and and such and so and so he gives this advice to stand up and say some psalms um and it's interesting that uh he says to start with the trisagion um there's a a practice and saint ignati virginia talks about it in the arena i think he calls it the rule of saint pacomius um but it's something i think all of us would be familiar with um because the uh, uh, it consists of the Trisagion prayers, O Heavenly King, Holy God, Most Holy Trinity, have mercy on us, glory now and ever, and the, our Father, right? We all know that one with the uh, um, uh, penitential triparia, have mercy on us, Lord, have mercy on us, we're laying aside all excuse. Um, uh, we all know those. And then uh, Psalm 50 and the Creed. Um, so it's to something like that that he's referring here. Um, uh, also, um, if you're sitting scrunched up on a on a stool, um, it's going to hurt after after a little while. Um, and so, uh, and also, um, this kind of prayer is profound concentration. And it's hard. It's it's hard to uh, preserve that that concentration uh, for uh, for that long. And here they're talking about hours at a time. Um, so when we lose our concentration, when we're uh, being battered with thoughts, and and all we can think about is our aching back, um, stand up, do some psalmody, uh, or go do something else for a while. Um, and then, then you can come back to it. Um, uh, let's see.
otherwise this, that's this is pretty uh pretty clear um and it and it and it's uh but this is but this is um start here this this is this is gold this is pure gold with the help of prayer ignore all images whether sensory or conceptual that rise up from the heart for stillness hezekiah means the shedding of all thoughts for a time even those which are divine and engendered by the spirit in other words when we enter into stillness into which is this next level of noetic prayer um there's no thoughts. It's a state of no thought, um, um, uh, and we and we reject both the good and the evil thoughts. Um, if God wants to get through to us, He'll call back later. Um, uh, otherwise, through giving them our attention, because they're good, we will lose what is better. Um, then He has a. Uh, uh, a very, very good section on delusion. Um, and then he talks about inner, uh, keeping watch um, of our inner attention, intention, um, whether it is for God or, or, uh, or for goodness or the benefit of the soul um, or whatever. Um, be conscious of that. So what I would uh, like people to do is to, you know, um, I put I put these together uh, not only to use for the class, um, but also for your own um, enrichment. So. Um, and it's about 830, so it's probably we have do we have are there more questions or comments? Metropolitan. Uh huh. Um, the breathing thing I thought was interesting, and Glenn would know more than I. But my understanding is that the Navy SEALs are big into breathing, and a lot of the military special forces because it it um, focuses their attention. Is that what that reference kind of was, or no? Well, um, there was a there was a whole um, methodology of breathing um, uh, during the saying of the Jesus Prayer. Um, and in some cases, it was more effective than others. Um, so uh, for the most part, um, modern teachers are not really utilizing uh, that method. I'm sure there are some someplace, but most of them, um, because it can lead to all sorts of, you know, people can hyperventilate or, the, you know, they're, you know. Um, now there's another method, which is, it's not really, um, it's not explicit in this, but it's you could say it's kind of referred to. Um, uh, when you silence your mind that deeply, um, you can hear your own heartbeat. And so some people will uh, synchronize the Jesus prayer with their heartbeat. Um, but even that, that can become a distraction. The breathing can become a distraction. Synchronizing with your heartbeat can become a distraction. Um, because the point is not to sit there and listen to your heartbeat. Um, the, the point is to be focusing on, uh, on, on God and being opening our complete awareness uh, to God. So, thank you, and also thank you for the shout out, uh, Saint Teresa of Avila. Ah, well, I like that. yeah, Saint Teresa, Saint John of the Cross are um, remarkable, holy. People and and Meister Eckhart too. I have great love for him. Um, yeah, one of the things we had learned just recently about Saint Teresa of Avila at our Catholic network was that she was so concerned these visions she had might not be from God that she told very few people. She told her spiritual confessors and she left all these journals. It wasn't until long after she died that they realized um, what was actually going on because she was so humble and she was just so. Mary Ford had told the story too. I remember at the Slow Grave Club. And they came to the March for Life about the Orthodox 
saint who could see the future and was saying, oh, don't buy that car because there's going to be an accident and then there'll be an accident and people get mad at him. And he prayed and he said, God, if this is not from you, take it away from me. And he never saw the future again. Oh. Yeah. Well, that's that's interesting. Father, Father Vladimir. So, I, uh, Vladika, um, what what general advice do you have for us lay people or you know non non monastics when we read this deep spiritual literature? Uh, how do we how do we take it? Because mm -hmm. I, I guess imagining that I am a great spiritual elder is not healthy. <laughs> well. I think I think what we can take it, and this is why, you know, why I'm presenting this this uh, these texts, is that we can use it as an encouragement, um, and that uh, and that we can, and that we can go beyond where we are. Um, you know, if we if we have a, a good solid uh, prayer practice of, you know, of the, the daily morning and evening prayers and occasional akathists and and uh, canons and things like that and um, and then intercessory prayer for others, uh, which are which are which is fantastic, um, but but going into the Jesus prayer um, is inc is is very powerfully transformative. Um, and it's it's this transformation that is the that is the real uh, goal in repentance. It's transformation of our of our consciousness, um, transformation of our whole being, um, and that you know. And even if we're not, even if we have no not the least expectation of attaining to the, that most profound you know kind of level of being an elder or something like that at least we can uh we can enter into that contemplative silence into that stillness um uh and and allow the holy spirit to work on our soul and to be transformed um and it's basically you know you these were the directions you know that we had just read um sit down be quiet um uh, and say the say the prayer. Um, and you know we start out, and and in that we have to learn how to ignore our thoughts, because the thoughts are going to come. But we have to recognize what's distraction, um, and not let it uh, and not let those distracting thoughts in. Just. Let them go. Recognize what it is and let it go, um, because we're trying to pray and not trying to think about eighteen other things. Um, and when we do that, um, eventually, and it takes sometimes it'll take a year or two. Sometimes it'll be a few months. It depends on the person and the intensity of their practice. Um, the the prayer will become uh, the Jesus prayer becomes more of an intention, um, and and um, and it you know it you know it starts out we're saying it orally, uh, then we say it in our mind, then the mind and you know unites with the, with the spirit with the with the news, uh, but then it can simply go straight into noetic prayer. Um, with the mind silenced in stillness. Um, and that's where that transformation really happens. Um, this is, this is, uh, there's also a strong parallel with the liturgy. You know, as, as we enter into the mystery, you know, it, it takes st several steps you know, first we have the ascent to the to the gospel reading, right? And then we have the next ascent um, uh, into into the to the very throne of God, where we're where we're contemplating Christ enthroned upon the cherubim with the Father, 
and the spirit, which is that's just the text of our liturgy. Um, but we have it. It takes time to get there. Um, the deeper the the experience of the Jesus prayer, and and of of noetic contemplation, the deeper the experience of the liturgy. And you see that the two are directly parallel. So somewhere one of the fathers talks about um, uh, where the the Hezekiah's prayer is is doing the liturgy in the heart so that we commune with Christ not in this not under the forms of bread and wine but you know but noetically spiritually and so but this is but this is this is really about this the actualization of our noetic awareness this is this is what we do with it um so i don't know what else does that answer the question yes yes Rudika. thank you I, I like the parallel with the liturgy yeah and uh how we can get deeper thank you yeah. okay so we uh Shall we pray and uh, and close for tonight? Yeah, and before we do that, uh, do you want to set a tentative date for our next meeting? Maybe March tenth or March seventeenth, or shall we leave that blank for now? Um, I would not do March seventeenth because that's forgiveness forgiveness Sunday, and um, now how about uh, we could do the um, Either the tenth or the seventeenth, or what about the twenty fourth? That's Orthodoxy Sunday. Whatever works for you, Ludvika. Um, I would say the twenty fourth. Okay. Thank you for skipping St. Patrick's Day. <laughs> Perfect. All right. All right. So um, we'll pray. It is truly me to bless the Theotokos, ever blessed and most blameless, and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, more glorious beyond compare than the seraphim, who without corruption that gave us birth to God the word, the very Theotokos, we magnify thee. The blessing of the Lord be upon you through his grace and love for mankind, always now and ever into ages of ages.